All right, welcome to the Burn Bootcamp podcast. I'm Victoria Cerisi. I serve as a Vice President of Culture at Burn Bootcamp. And we are so thrilled to have Jimmy Springston on the show today to discuss the concept of nonviolent communication, um, the relevance of empathy and creating connection. Uh, Jimmy has actually worked with us at Burn Bootcamp for about nine months. Um, he served in the military, in the Air Force, and then um, post-military, he worked for USAA as an integrator of the EOS model, and now he's a business coach. And so he's been working with us, like I said, for nine months. How are you doing today, Jimmy? I'm doing good. I'm doing really good. So I've been with the Burn team all day, and yes. uh, we had a great offsite for all the leaders in the company. Yeah. So I'm excited to be here. Perfect. Well, for those that are wondering more about nonviolent communication, we're going to spend time today really going through what this is and how to use it in your lives personally and professionally. So sit back, grab a notebook, and get ready to unleash your potential. All right, Jimmy. So can you describe nonviolent communication from your lens of what, what is nonviolent communication? From my lens, nonviolent communication is a specific way to approach your relationships and your interactions with people in the world in a way to where you become more aware of your feeling and responses to, to your interactions with the world and people. It helps you kind of analyze if things are going well, like what's working and then what's not working, and then a language to formulate like how do you make requests if let's say some of your needs aren't getting met, how do you nonviolently, you know, let other people know that a need's going unmet and that, you know, propose uh, a, a strategy or solution to get that need met? Yeah. Um, and something I, I didn't share, and I, I want to make sure that we give credit. So um, the book, Nonviolent Communication, by the late Marshall Rosenberg, is kind of the premise of what we're kind of going through today. And so um, this is going to be the resource, and we can link it for, for those that are watching. Highly recommend it, but this is really the foundation of everything that we're going to talk about today. And ha have you heard the term compassionate communication? I haven't, no. So when we read this at Burn Boot Camp, our leadership team, we, um, we almost didn't, we didn't love the word nonviolent. So we turned the phrase around to be compassionate communication. But truly, it is what, what Jimmy was saying is how to use words that are not violent and uh, received. And so I wanted to make sure we referenced that book. Yeah, it's hard at the beginning, especially when you're new to it. And I, when I tell people about nonviolent communication, that's usually the response is, I don't like the name. Yes. I don't like the title. Are you saying I'm violent? You know, uh -huh. and it's like, no, it's almost like you got to read the book to really understand what he means yes. by the word violent. Uh, but I, yeah, I get that a lot. I've definitely have felt the same way. Yeah, perfect. Well, let's go ahead and um, maybe discuss some of the benefits of using um, NVC, nonviolent communication, in your personal and professional relationships. Yeah, so <clears throat> maybe I'll leave in the background of how we got Great. introduced to it. It might, might explain the why a okay. little more. So I had joined uh, a construction company out of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I'd spent time in the Air Force and at USAA and then joined the company in a leadership role as the integrator and we were putting in EOS and you know usually with the EOS journey comes a lot of change mm. and with a lot of change sometimes can come fear and frustrations and, and some conflict and we were just noticing the visionary and I that we weren't as effective at communicating our feelings and emotions and speaking our truth as we would like to be. I would say, um, you know, he might have been more violent with his communication that he liked. And I would say my challenge was I didn't speak up enough. I was too passive. I had trouble holding people accountable or just calling people out if an expectation wasn't being met, like a behavior expectation or a performance expectation for, for the job. And so we both realized quickly we needed to get coached up in, in you know, more effective communication techniques. Yeah. So we were introduced um, to a coach, a life coach, Stacy Vicari, and then mm. Stacy's the one that introduced us to Myers-Briggs and nonviolent communication and started coaching us on how to use the tools in the book. 
I yeah, love it. Um, you mentioned Myers-Briggs, so you, that's more of a strengths assessment, right? So identifying w natural giftings and then... Yeah, I, I would have just said personality profile, but okay. it would talk about like, are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? And all those, Got it. you know, I'm an INFJ and he's a whatever, you know, and like how do these two profiles coexist and become like yin and yang to each other instead of, you know, pol polar yeah. opposites that are, you know, having a lot of friction and conflict. And, and NVC was the way we be, it was like the, the way we talked that helped us become like more aware of each other and handle our conflict better and come to a better resolution quicker where it actually built up the relationship instead of, you know, fracturing the relationship. Yeah. So I, I appreciate Jimmy just kind of shared from a professional lens of how he's used it. I'd love to ask, have you used this personally? in your, your personal relationships? Yeah, I think NVC, to get good at it, you have to practice. It's kind of clunky at the beginning. And, you know, the way I was coached was you need to practice with uh, people that know you're doing it, and ideally they're doing it with you, like they're on the journey together, or with complete strangers you're never going to see again. Yeah. So it was really helpful early. You know, I had my boss at work. We were super close. So we were practicing at the office, you know, practicing hard conversations before we had to have them, you know, with other employees or other stakeholders that our business interacted with. Um, and then luckily my wife was interested, so she read the book. And so I had a couple avenues, but it was nice being able to practice both at home and yeah. at work. And then now over the years, because it's probably been three years since we've kind of adopted it as, yeah. as our communication style, um, we brought it to our, our, our daughter, yeah. who, who's seven. So, you know, we introduced her to the concepts of like being aware of her feelings, then taking that, that feeling real quick and, and like analyzing for like what need is being met or, yeah. or going unmet, and then teaching her how to like speak up and formulate a request uh, to the group or the family to try to get that need met. But in a way that still respects the free will yes. and the other people, so it doesn't come out, you know is an unpleasant, snarky remark. She, she hopefully will phrase it in a way that, you know, gives us ears for hearing because mm -hmm. it's delivered in a way that, that makes it more receptive. I love that you mentioned your daughter uh, because when, when I first read the book, I have three boys and with young men growing up, sometimes they don't know how to articulate their feelings and it's usually just one word, I'm fine or yeah. Not good. And so putting it into practice, not just professionally, but personally for me, allowed me to kind of give a framework for my children to, based on observations, how does that make you feel? What needs do you have? And so um, thank you for sharing I get that. more men shifting in their seats when we talk about uncomfortable. feelings uh -huh. and needs. And I try to put them at ease. Like, you know, in, in NBC, there's, it's a process. They yes. call it a process language. So it, the process is observation feeling, need, request. Perfect. And, you know, I try to put them at ease. The people that are feeling resistant, it's not always the men, but stereotypically, it, it's the men. And it's, it's the feeling part. Yep. And, and part of it is just they, they've never had the language or, or it's just kind of not a thing that we're supposed to talk about yeah. is, is our feelings. But luckily, NBC, you don't spend a lot of time on the feeling I say that the feeling's more just like a piece of data. Like as a, as a former math major and analyst yeah. in the Air Force, I love data. And to me, this actually went, and I love processes. So NVC actually kind of met, you know, a lot of, of what I liked about math and processes was that there's like a data and a way to do things. And so I would say the feelings are like data. Your, your body's sending you data. So you're, you're tense, tension in your neck, you're feeling flush, you know. That might be the data your body's sending you that there's an unpleasant feeling mm -hmm. going on. But you only have to spend a few seconds on that. It's, the point is just to become aware basically about like, is it pleasant or unpleasant? And just kind of how intense is it? And then really the rest of the time is spent understanding and kind of getting to the root cause of like, well, what need is being met or not being met? And so in the business world, you know, at work and you're dealing with conflict all day, you're constantly experiencing unpleasant feelings but now I feel like thanks to NVC you have a way to like oh there's the unpleasant feeling now I'm going to try to like get to the root cause of like what needs not getting met that way I can formulate a request back to the person and hopefully start getting that need met but actually and I might be skipping ahead but 
NBC even starts first. Even if I'm having an unpleasant feeling, my first ideal reaction is to think about the other person and why, what yes. need are they trying to get met that might be going against my need. So it actually starts with empathy first, where I need to Perfect. listen first. I need to think about why would they be doing this thing that's frustrating me. So it actually starts with empathy for the other person, even before you really start thinking about your own need and your own request. And then it's just kind of rinse and repeat back and forth, just trying to understand both sides because we're all trying to get our needs met. Yeah, I love that. It, it, so you're not jumping ahead at all. Anything you want to share is just so valuable. Um, I want to hit on what you mentioned about the unpleasant or pleasant. So it's just awareness right out of the gate of, okay, that sat well with me or it didn't, and then taking it deeper. And so this leads into the next question of how is that different? How would NBC be different than regular communication methods from your lens? I would say, I don't want to speak for other people. So for me, my before NBC, my regular communication was internal. Most oh. of I would process, a lot of things would go on internally and I wouldn't express myself, which kind of meets my need for comfort and, and ease in that moment because I avoided conflict. Mm -hmm. But, you know, pay me now or pay me later. It's going to catch up with me. So for me, a lot of the communication wasn't happening was the problem. Yeah. And so, and then let's say it did, the problem might be that I let things go, get pent up too much, like too much pressure is building yes. up and then it might really come out and then when I did communicate in that situation, I might be using very subjective, vague language or just that violent communication, he says, is usually around judgment language where you're kind of attacking the other person instead of maybe reformulating what you want to say in a way that doesn't attack the other person. But it's talking about like, hey, when this fact happened, I felt blank. I think that has to do with my need for blank. Are you open to considering this new strategy. Um, so it gives you a way to talk about it if you were like me, um, where I would avoid. So now I'm less likely to avoid speaking up because I know I can still communicate to another person I care about, but not you know, hurt their feelings or damage the relationship. So it just gives me more freedom to speak up more often, but do that in a way that you know maintains my need for kindness. I'd love to, I would love to kind of talk through practical applications in daily life. So you're talking about needs, feelings, requests. If someone hasn't read this book, what are some ways that they can hear what you're saying and apply it right now into their daily life? Yeah, I, I think Marshall says in the book, the woman that trained our company, so our life coach introduced us to it, and then we liked it so much that we wanted more. So then we we went online and we, we actually found a woman, uh, Dr. Cindy Bigby. Uh, she's out of Tallahassee, Florida. She would do this in schools in Florida. Uh -huh. And so we asked her to come in and train our company. So she trained everyone with a leadership role in our company, leaders and managers, on this, this language. And, and I don't know if it was her or Marshall in the book, but a lot of what happens at the beginning is just internal. Mm -hmm. It's just starting to pay attention. like. The next time you're in a, in a meeting or an offsite or meeting with a customer or struggling with a vendor that's not meeting your needs, like, and you're, you're feeling those frustrations. So a lot of it's just like practicing. There's a little needs and feelings sheet that I found helpful. Um, I would carry that around. And I would just practice kind of in my head or in traffic if somebody's cutting me off. It was, at the beginning, it was just like paying attention to all the times I had unpleasant feelings and mm. frustrations noticing the feeling, but then quickly flipping over to the needs. And there's this whole sheet of all these needs, and they're kind of grouped into similar categories. But it was just me becoming more in touch with myself about what are my big needs. And I started to notice a pattern yep. of which needs of mine kept showing up the most. So that was kind of step one from a practicality, was just paying attention to our, for me, it was unpleasant feelings, but, you know, it would be nice if I paid attention to my pleasant feelings yeah. too. But it was really just a lot of internal noticing and getting this needs and feelings sheet out and just starting to figure out what are my common needs that keep coming up. Could you consider sharing a couple, like what are some of those needs? Like name them. 
Yeah, so I would say a big need of mine is like consistency and predictability. Okay. So if I had a meeting on my calendar at work and another leader on the leadership team canceled it last minute, mm. like I would notice, I would get frustrated and I'd have to get my need sheet. I'm like, what is it? Is it respect? Is it predictability? Is it, you know, I'd go through them all yeah. and I'd figure out, and a lot of mine I found out was my need for like consistency and predictability. So once I became aware of that, now I was more comfortable setting or resetting expectations with the leadership team. Like, mm -hmm. hey guys, let's talk about, you know, group norms. Like I've had a few observations lately. I try to keep it as fact-based as possible. I've had three meetings in the last week get canceled you know, within two hours of the meeting, that's really disruptive to my flow. It's hard to reschedule, mm -hmm. you know, so I would talk about my need for predictability and consistency. And my request would be, you know, that they just try to manage my expectations better yeah. and, um, you know, have some respect for the commitments we've made and the agreements we've made to meet at a certain time and place. Yeah. So that was a common one in work and maybe like a need for awareness. Like if people are out making decisions in the business, you know, I would, I would analyze the need and feeling shape. If I found out a decision was, was made that I wasn't aware of, you know, the unpleasant feeling happened. Yep. I looked at the sheet, I was like, oh, this was about me being included and me being aware of an important decision to the business. So I would go back to the team at our weekly staff meeting, state the fact like, hey, this decision was made, I wasn't included. And I would just like, you know, in the future to reset expectations on decisions like these, please include me, you know, I have a need for awareness. So it was, it was usually just small things over and over again. My big ones were predictability, awareness, yeah. engagement. Like if okay. I ran a staff meeting and, and somebody didn't participate, I would notice I was getting annoyed with them, mm -hmm. you know, or frustrated that they weren't engaged in the meeting and they weren't participating. And so again, I would get the needs sheet out and I noticed there's several needs around participation and engagement and collaboration. And so once I became aware like, oh, that was a need that kept coming up. Now I could again reset expectations with the team yeah. or show appreciation when people did participate and engage. Like, hey, thank you so much for participating, engaging in that meeting, that really meant a lot to me. And so that was a way to like reset Enforcing expectations. Enforcing the behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so just paying attention over and over again made me aware of which behaviors and actions other people did that either met or didn't meet my needs, which really helped me go back through and reset expectations. And then once those expectations were set, yeah. it became easier and easier to hold people accountable or to show appreciation if the, if the expectation was met or not met. But I'd made those expectations clear. It was no surprise to anyone, which again, increased my comfort level with having hard conversations and holding people accountable or showing appreciation, yes. which I also struggled with because I was becoming more aware of the things that led to pleasant feelings or unpleasant feelings. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I can imagine. So you mentioned Dr. Bigby and it started with schools, schools in, in yeah, Florida. I'm pretty sure she started working with like teenagers in yeah. public schools in Tallahassee, Florida, teaching them about like behavior regulation and better ways to, to, to have conflict that didn't yeah. get them in trouble. Right. And so I think she was brought in with, with, with like maybe troubled teens or something. And then Luckily for us, she pivoted because whether you're a teen yeah. or a grown up, I mean, it's, it's, it's still feelings it's, and needs yep. and communication how do we have conflict. It? Yep, exactly. I was going to ask so, how do you, from an organizational lens, um, I love you mentioned the word empathy. And so we just kind of went through identifying our own pleasant or unpleasant feelings, tying it to a need that's being unmet. But then, where's the empathy come in? So, yeah. <clears throat> so, NBC starts with connection. So, even before. Yeah. I express my feelings and needs and make a request to you, let's say, my first step is to put myself in your shoes, to like listen first, to seek to understand before being understood, you know? And so it would start with empathy. Empathy. So usually whatever preceded or came before the feeling is something you probably did. Like a, mm -hmm. a thing you said or a, a body language you exhibited right. in a meeting or the lack of participation. So ideally I would put myself in your shoes like, well, 
Vic normally participates in meetings, or Vic normally doesn't cancel on me last yeah. minute, or Vic normally is on time to work. So I would have to put myself in your shoes and think and think about like, well, why might you have done those things? What might you be feeling? What might your need be? Maybe yeah. being late went against my need, but it might have met your need for saying goodbye to your husband who was about to go on a trip. Yeah. So it's like you met your need, you know, and it, but if we don't talk about it and have a healthy way to talk about it, this could lead to conflict. If I'm feeling offended right. and you are just trying to be a good spouse and now you think I'm being a controlling boss, you know, it's like yep. it could lead to a lot of tension. So it, it usually starts with like giving a gracious read, assuming the best intent in the other person, that they had a good reason and that they were just trying to meet a need of their own or someone else they cared about, yeah. even though it might have been in direct conflict with one of my needs. So it kind of starts out trying to get you to think out of a positive, like abundance mindset, that the I, world's I not that. out to get you. There's yep. probably a good reason. Yep. And to give that empathy and connect with that person before you launch in. Yeah, I love that he used the term gracious read. And so to me, that's a, it's a, almost like a humility in yourself of, of seeing empathy as putting yourself in the other person's shoes and then starting with that before you just come at all the needs that you have. And you shared that with us today as a, a yeah. leadership team. And so I love that term, gracious read. I want can to I, talk, oh, can please, I add one more please. Thing? One of the things I know you're, you and I both share a passion for is culture index. Yes. So like, again, in the business world, once we as a company adopted a personality profiling tool, whether it's Myers-Briggs or DISC or Predictive Index or Culture Index, that to me is another practical tool that helps with the empathy because a lot of the time, you know, if my visionary is a very dominant person with low patience and I'm a more collaborative, su submissive person with high patience, like, we just have different needs. We're both trying to get our needs met. I'm trying to move slow, be methodical, yes. be planned out. He's wanting to make progress and achieve. And so that's also where practical tools that helped us as a company and in our, in our marriage, we've, we've, my wife and I have gone through the personality profile and we yep. know each other's profiles. I think something like culture index or predictive or any of those can really complement the NBC journey because it's a quicker way to build empathy because I know your profile Yes. And I think that also helps with the gracious reads because I'm like, it's not personal that my visionary is doing this to me. Like, that's just what visionaries do. They like movement. They have a mm -hmm. need for spontaneity and adventure and progress. And they like challenge and conflict where I don't. I like ease and yeah. harmony and peace and consistency. So, like, just baked into our personality profiles is kind of like, how we have opposite needs. Mm -hmm. And what usually is if I'm trying to get my needs met and I'm not thinking about him, then when I get my need met, it's gonna be in direct conflict with his needs. So now once we, we had access to this language and, and like the profiling tools, it really made for a more harmonious, we created the conditions for better conflict yes, and empathy with each other. So I just wanted to make sure I plug whatever profiling tool, yeah. Enneagram, Myers, any of them, I mean, I think they can all help on the yeah. NBC journey and accelerate that empathy. I love that tying in, identifying where is someone naturally gifted and if that's their natural tendency, it's gonna be hard for someone to flex outside who they naturally are. And so it starts with that. And so I love that you shared that. And that leads right into my next question about um, tying this into levels of leadership within an organization. Um, is there anything you would share to, you mentioned the visionary that, that you've worked with. Anything that you would share for leaders in um, how they can implement this or start this in their organization? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot we did. Um, simple things like printing the needs and feeling sheets once we went through the training and having them scattered throughout the office just so we, we all had access to the language as we were practicing. Uh, having one-on-ones with like someone we trusted that was also doing the NBC, like my visionary and I would practice a lot of hard conversations. If yeah. I was gonna have to hold someone on the leadership team accountable, I was feeling hesitant, a little nervous, but, and I wanted to practice this new tool we had of NBC, we might practice in a one-on-one -on -one together. That was another thing that we would do. Um, we, we would have same page meetings, like with direct reports, and, and one of the things that really worked for us is we'd start every one-on-one -on -one um, with, hey, give me one pleasant and one unpleasant yes. feeling from the last week. And then let's say 
you know, uh, the manager in front of me would say like, oh, well, I'm feeling grateful and I'm feeling, you know, really upbeat and, 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 and you know, all those positive feelings. I'm like, okay, great. That's your feeling. What need was met? And she's like, well, I had a, a need for movement and learning and mm -hmm. growth and all, and, and all these things. And I'd be like, okay, now tell me about what happened. And then she would tell me how she went to a conference. And she would tell me about the thing that happened that led, that met the need that led to the pleasant feeling. And then now as her boss, I knew her better. And I started to, we started to brainstorm, okay, well, how do we keep getting that need more, met over yeah. and over and put in systems and change her role a little bit to just keep making a more enjoyable place for her to work and then flip it around. What's your unpleasant feeling? Mm -hmm. She would vent a little about, you know, this, this unpleasant thing that happened to her and what needs were, you know, and not yeah. being met. And then what we would do is we would practice, she would practice in VC. Like I would be her practice partner so that she was prepared to go out and have uh, that conversation yes. with whomever. But one of the things we would also do is like, you know, she would have to take a deep breath and practice empathy for that other person that had just triggered her. So we would use our one-on-ones to practice it. We'd practice it with upset. You know, we were a, a federal construction management company. Okay. So we worked a lot with VA hospitals and the government. A lot of bureaucracy. A lot. Mm. So a lot of times we were like pseudo practicing our NVC with our customers or with the subcontractor that we were frustrated or they were frustrated with us. I mean, there's there's unpleasant conversations and feelings going around all over the place. Right. So it wasn't just internal to our company. We would even start to bring it um, to how we solve problems better and be more aware of our vendors and our clients' needs so that we could better meet those needs and put in processes and systems and metrics to help us meet those needs on a consistent basis and then measure whether or not you know were successful. we were doing those things right. and that it was resulting in better customer service feedbacks and things like that. Um, so that we can kind of um, give this, the group some like key takeaways. If someone's interested in kind of implementing this or taking the next step, what are some things they can do? And then just overall, any last things you'd want to share about um, why nonviolent communication works? Yeah, so ways to get started. I think Devin just jumped right into YouTube. Okay. I think he just started watching a bunch of YouTube videos, so that's that's yeah. one option. I picked up the NVC book, yep. really liked it, yeah. um, found somebody to just practice with. And there's other books, kind of like EOS has a whole library of, of books, like you know Rocket Fuel and How to Be a Great Boss and Process and all those. So EO, or, uh, Nonviolent Communication um, has a similar set of books. There's the book you, you showed us. There's one called Empathy Factor. Okay. That's all about getting NVC to work in business. Um, and, and I've been told that there's some pretty successful companies on like the Fortune 50 that like you have to read NVC to be on the leadership team. So that was like motivation yes. to us. So like, oh, businesses take this serious. So someone wrote a book about, you know, how to apply NVC in business. Um, so there's, there's definitely some other books out there too. Um, we went as far to hire Dr. Bigby, but yep. that wasn't one of our first steps. I would say our first steps was read the book, Devin's was watch some YouTube videos, and just start practicing yeah. with someone you trust um, that doesn't think you're a big weirdo, because it's kind of awkward at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so th those might be some, some simple ways. You know, I'll share, once I read the book, I put it in practice in the HR space at Burn. And so oftentimes a leader will come in or an employee will come in and they'll have a a pleasant or an unpleasant feeling and putting it into practice to help them articulate what was the observation that you made, taking it back to what they observed. Um, we haven't gone as deep with identifying the needs. And so that's a takeaway for us is the needs and feelings sheet. We're laminating them, we're gonna put them all over the office and we're so excited to go deeper on this. Um, and then personally, you know, using in, in my marriage with my children and so Guys, consider using this because uh, it's, a, it's a way to create connection. And at Burn Boot Camp, we're all about creating community, and you do that through human connection. And so what better way to do it than, you know, through something like nonviolent communication? Yeah, a lot of my clients, they really want to get better at accountability. Yes. That's their objective. Or they want to get better at appreciation. And I think NVC helps with both. Love that. It, it helps us have feel more confident for those of us who 
who are a little hesitant to hold people accountable because we're worried about the way we deliver it and if we'll, 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 we'll anger the other, the other employee and they'll leave the company or, or yeah. something. Or, um, so I would say usually the NVC is a solution if you're really trying to figure out a system or like a more sustainable uh -huh. way than just grit and, and hope and willpower yeah. to like how are we going to like consciously and intentionally continuously get better at appreciation and accountability and I haven't found anything even close to giving me a system that I could scale across a company and get everyone trained on yeah. to, to do those two things. Yeah. Um, as our coach at Burn Boot Camp, Jimmy has really emphasized, so you've heard him reference EOS quite a bit, which is the entrepreneurial operating system based on the book Traction. And it's basically how we manage our business. The second part is using something like Culture Index to identify strengths and and um, you know gaps for us individually, and then the third, the glue is this nonviolent communication. And um, I want to just take anyone that's out there that's leading a team of people through that little journey of it's, you know, do you want to yeah. add anything to yeah, that? Yeah. So we started with EOS. Yes. And it was it was great. I love EOS. I recommend it to to everybody. But it it won't do it all. So it'll That's help right. with data and processes and rhythms, but it didn't touch the social emotional challenges yeah. we were facing as we were transforming a company, bringing in accountability, bringing in processes, all this data. It, it was just, it was yeah. challenging. So we knew we needed something and EOS just, in, in no fault of its own, it just, it can't do everything. So that's when we were like, well, we need a coach. So we, mm. and then the coach introduced us to a, like a real, a real solve, a long-term solve, like a profiling tool yep. and an NVC. And I don't think you could have one, like you could have culture index without NVC, but just because you have awareness of yourself You're 100% and right. the other people, it almost can make you more dangerous yeah. if you don't know how to express that. If you had NVC without culture index, you, I think you would eventually get there because you would eventually, by having all those empathetic conversations, learn about other people and yourself slowly. But I think Culture Index speeds it up and gives us an, another like few chapters of, of words we have access okay. to, to, you know. And so, and then I like EOS because without EOS and some type of operating system, a lot of these good, well-intentioned initiatives just kind of dissipate over time and they don't have anything to stick to. Yeah. So I know lots of companies that did culture index or predictive index before they had EOS and it just kind of faded away. Yeah. I can't imagine trying to get NVC started without EOS. So I do think they all need each other and even EOS by itself, it's, it could almost do more damage especially at the beginning as you're flooded with all this awareness and change. If you don't have language Mm -hmm. and empathy about yourself and the team and a way to talk about it. Uh, I, I, I could easily see EOS actually doing more harm, at least at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think if you, if you can integrate all three, it can make for like a really thriving and efficient and effective company, both from a social emotional, but, social emotional, but also just from a business performance. Because you just learn more about your clients, your teams, your attention's higher. You solve problems faster. You you tackle the elephant in the room more yep. often. You hold people accountable. They rise to the occasion. Um, so it actually helps the bottom line too. Love it, yeah. and it, and honestly, um, helps your culture. Absolutely. You know, people have more pleasant feelings, hopefully, than the unpleasant feelings. Yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed our time here. Um, thank you so much, yeah, Jimmy, for you. sharing your wisdom with us and your insights. And um, hopefully you guys learned something. Uh, we'd love for you to like and subscribe um, to this podcast. And we just so appreciate you guys. And as always, we end everything with two claps on two. One, two.